Emperor Trajan scales new heights of glory, defeating the treacherous Dacians, reaping a fortune in barbarian gold, and pushing the imperial borders to their limit. It is the zenith of the empire. Now, after three centuries of relentless war, Rome stands at the center of the world, a lone superpower without rival. But peace makes the empire soft. Wrapped in luxury, distracted by elaborate games in the arena, the Romans are slow to recognize the threat of a new barbarian horde, bent on the empire's utter destruction. In the 200 years following Julius Caesar's death, the empire blossoms. Peace and prosperity usher in Rome's golden and silver ages. But it may be too much of a good thing. The peace had, of course, allowed Rome to concentrate their economic energies inward, away from military affairs. And it's this that may have produced the sort of general air of prosperity and flourishing of arts. It may also, however, have had various pernicious side effects. The people, as they became used to not fighting, found themselves subsequently reluctant to fight. They may have left themselves somewhat less prepared than they otherwise would have been. But barbarians along the frontier, ever restless, continue to probe and raid seeking weak spots on the empire's immense borders. By 160 AD, the border stretches across three continents, and 400,000 soldiers protect the 50 million people lucky enough to live inside. Back in Rome, the young heirs to the imperial throne live a comfortable life in their father's palace. Their names are Marcus Aurelius, and Lucius Verus. Plucked from separate aristocratic families while still boys, both are adopted by Emperor Antoninus Pius, who has no sons of his own. The princes could not be more different, according to third century historian Cassius Dio. Marcus was often frail of health and devoted the greater part of his time to letters. Verus, on the other hand, was a vigorous man of younger years. A free spirit, Verus's rowdy exploits frequently shock Rome. In contrast, intellectual Marcus Aurelius takes his position seriously. Marcus Aurelius had been groomed for rule longer than just about anyone else in the history of the empire. Between his two sons, Emperor Antoninus has a clear favorite the scholarly Marcus. To him, he gives his prized possession, his daughter Faustina, making Marcus the senior heir. In 161, when the emperor Antoninus dies, Marcus and Verus claim the throne, supported and approved of by the emperor's personal army, the Praetorian Guard. It would have been easy for the Praetorians to accept these two young men as their emperors. Of all the troops of the empire, the Praetorians would have known them because they were stationed in Rome and they would therefore have been guarding the palace and they would have had interactions with these two princes over many years. They cement their bond to the Praetorians with a generous kickback, a bonus equal to several years of regular guardsmen's salary. Marcus and Verus will need the loyalty of the Roman army as war looms large on the horizon. To the east, the Parthians invade Rome's ally, Armenia, making Syria vulnerable to attack. Classical historian Cassius Dio the Parthian general hemmed in the Romans on all sides, striking them down and destroying the whole force, leaders and all. 
The fighting is savage, and Roman forces cannot hold against the Parthian assault. In 162, Rome has no choice but to send its troops to war. For the first time in two generations, an emperor leads the way, Lucius Verus. His brother, Marcus Aurelius, remains in Rome. Both men really were inexperienced militarily. Marcus, who is the senior of the two emperors, uh, sends Lucius Verus to the east to deal with this threat. Verus marches from Rome to a comfortable headquarters in Antioch, far from the battlefront. He's constantly in communication, or at least his bureaucracy is constantly in communication with leaders on the front. But mostly this is a, a leadership in absentia. And it works. It works as long as you've got good leaders up front. Fortunately on the front, Verus is one of the best leaders of his generation, Avidius Cassius, the commander of Syria's legions. Avidius has been a longtime player in imperial politics, but war proves to be his real talent. He was an experienced general. He was himself Syrian. He had connections with the nobility of the East. Verus had just stayed in Antioch and partied, basically, while Avidius had run the campaign on the ground. Avidius masterminds a string of victories that take the Romans into the Parthian heartland, face to face with their enemy. The real killing that Roman soldiers did came at arm's length. That frightened everybody. To keep fighting at arm's length when your enemy is there with a sword or an ax and you can't tell what's going on behind you or to the side of you because you're wearing a helmet. You can hardly hear and you can only see straight ahead. It required courage and dedication in overcoming your fear uh, to an overwhelmingly amazing degree. Over the next three years, Avidius and his troops make a brutal sweep across Parthia. In 165 AD, they reach the capital Tessaphon, which lies near modern Baghdad. The Romans cruelly ravaged the ancient city. Classical historian Cassius Dio. When the Parthian king was deserted by his allies, Avidius pursued him into Tessaphon and razed his palace to the ground. The looting gets out of hand. While plundering the temples of the local gods, the soldiers steal sacred vessels and other treasures. It's an abomination to violate temples. Divine punishment for the crime comes swift and furious. The soldiers contract a deadly disease from their Parthian victims, possibly bubonic plague. The Romans leave Tessaphon swollen on success and unwittingly carrying contagion. Having conquered Parthia and secured the Eastern Empire, Avidius and Emperor Verus return to Italy. The city honors the glorious victory with a magnificent parade, public feasts, and games that pit gladiators against captives, all part of an extraordinary exhibition known as a triumph. Hundreds of thousands of people would be coming out to watch. They'd be waving flags, throwing things, and cheering as the army went by. And then behind that would be just a massive display of captured loot, captives, um, heaps of arms that had been captured. So it was a really an enormous public occasion. Months in the making at the cost of a small fortune, the triumph is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Verus celebrates with his new bride, Lucilla, the daughter of his brother and co-emperor, Marcus. 
when Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus celebrated this triumph in the 160s. The whole generation had been born and had reached middle age and had never seen a triumph. So it was a huge event. It would have been a major event. But Emperor Marcus is unable to enjoy the festivities. He knows that the campaign in the east has greatly depleted Rome's army. And even as Rome parties, savage barbarians prepare to attack the reduced defenses on the empire's northern frontier. Along the northern border, the legionaries left to guard the fortifications are seriously undermanned. Too few troops have returned from the war in the east. The guards make an easy target for barbarian tribesmen who creep out of the dense woods to prey on the Romans. The fighting abilities of the Germans in the second century had grown proportionally, astronomically, compared to the, the initial encounter between Germans and Romans that went all the way back into the second century BC. Um, these were tribes that could field very large armies for a start, so they were really formidable. Already by the second century, they were very formidable. Out on the edges of the empire, soldiers are mercilessly cut down. The dark forests of Germania become their tomb. Brothers Marcus and Verus share the title of emperor. Their general, Avidius Cassius, successfully conquers the great Parthian Empire, but at a terrible price. The soldiers carry back a great pestilence to Rome. The Parthian War of Marcus's adopted brother, Lucius Verus, seems to have been responsible for bringing back some form of plague into the Mediterranean basin, which led to simply untold devastation of the population of the empire. Some very, very large percentage of the Roman world died off in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Estimates vary from 10 to 25%. And it will have been very, very much worse in major population centers because the people were piled one on top of each other. Charlatans prey on the people's fears, selling bogus herbal charms to ward off disease. They say the plague is the god's revenge for raiding Parthian temples. Emperor Marcus must atone for their sin with a sacrifice. The only rational response for a Roman emperor in the face of a giant natural disaster like a plague was to try to restore our peace with the gods by increasing sacrifices, by increasing public manifestations of devotion to the gods because in, in a case of a natural disaster, the emperor had the responsibility of preserving the people by winning back the goodwill of the gods. Despite seven days of sacrifice, the gods are still hungry. The death toll continues to rise, especially among the troops in the army camps. So a lot of experienced soldiers would have been lost and uh, large numbers of the civilian population. So it was hard to rebound quickly. Wounded and sick, the empire is weak. Its enemies swoop in for the kill. In 167, 6,000 German barbarians crossed the Danube River and burst into the Roman province of Pannonia. They ravage the unprotected provincials at will, 
plundering villages and taking hundreds of hostages. Some barbarians even claim land. We don't know whether they're just raiding or whether they want to migrate. A lot of the tribes see the advantages of Roman civilization and would like to have a piece of the action. So raids uh, become frequent and it's hard for Marcus to mobilize the troops to keep them out. For several agonizing days, the barbarians attack the defenseless Pannonia. The Roman legions are too far away, strung out along the vast frontier. When the legionaries arrive at last, the ferocity of the Germans nearly overwhelms them. I suspect that a lot of them would have had imitation style or even captured Roman equipment. Um, so I think a German army of the time of Marcus Aurelius would have presented quite a formidable facade. Just as the first wave falters, more Roman troops arrive from other points along the border. Their well-timed cavalry assault, coupled with fresh infantry, forces the barbarians to retreat. Showing incredible confidence, the German warlord Balamarius of the powerful Marcomanni tribe ventures into the Roman camp to negotiate a peace treaty. Surprisingly, he represents not only his own people, but 10 other tribes as well. This unified front spells a new type of danger for the empire. The German threat that Marcus faced was different from the one that had been faced by earlier emperors. They've become more organized. Their societies have changed, probably by influence and exposure to the Romans. There's a great irony there. Alarmed by the growing barbarian menace, Emperor Marcus heads for Pannonia. With no experience in battle, Emperor Marcus must rely on his chief military officer, Pompeianus, to help him earn his glory. German raids had gone across the Danube, uh, stealing cattle, stealing um, slaves, stealing uh, uh, goods for centuries. Why now does Rome actually decide it's going to lead an expedition, a punitive expedition against these Germans? In my estimation, Marcus Aurelius is simply building that into a case for more military activity in order to give himself more legitimacy in Rome. Though Marcus's brother, Emperor Verus, also joins the campaign, he is drunk and unwell. Before they can even reach the border, Verus succumbs to plague, forcing the entire expedition to turn back. Marcus has no choice but to return to Rome with his brother's body, abandoning the northern border to the ever-growing barbarian threat. he returns to a court facing its own crisis. The empire's many wars have exhausted the royal treasury. There is nothing left to fund a new expedition against the Germans. Most officials probably were wealthy enough that a missed payday wouldn't matter much. But a soldier who was basically living hand to mouth and supplementing that living by gathering booty from conquest, those things begin to matter. Unable to pay his soldiers, Marcus resorts to extreme measures according to the Augustan history. Marcus held a public sale of his own imperial furnishings. He sold goblets of gold and crystal, and even his wife's silken gold embroidered robes. It's uh, sort of as if the royal family in England ran out of money and had to put a lot of, you know, had to put the crown jewels in eBay or something to raise money. I call this a public relations scheme because you couldn't possibly raise enough money to manage a war by selling off your second and even your third set of China, which is more or less what the emperor did. But it amounted to an attempt to show that even the emperor was going to make a personal sacrifice in favor of the common good. The sort of sacrifice that Americans once made in the buying of war bonds uh, in World War II.
Marcus's recruiters hope the money will help lure new soldiers for the German war, but the call to arms gets few takers. The Roman Empire was suffering a huge drain in manpower and economic power, and this may well have made people reluctant to sign up and left families terribly, terribly reluctant to send off healthy young males to war. Resurgent attacks of plague also stretched the empire's resources to the limit. Scandalously, Pompeianus, Emperor Marcus's chief military advisor, turns to the dregs of society, as the Augustan history reports. They armed gladiators and turned the bandits of Dalmatia into soldiers. They even trained slaves for military service. Pompeianus is appalled by the quality of recruits. But before he can prepare this ragtag army for war, disaster strikes on the empire's border. In 169, swarms of German warrior bands attack Roman provinces on the Danube. Marcus and Pompeianus must lead their new legions north to Germania, ready or not. Fighting on the barbarians' home turf, the inexperienced Roman army is clearly outmatched. When Germans were able to draw the Romans into across the Danube and fight in forested terrain uh, where the Roman soldiers were not able to de develop their military lines, not able to use their auxiliaries effectively, the Germans had the advantage and they often won. In the spring of 170, the greatest of the German tribes, the Marcomanni and the Quadi, square off against the Romans and crush them. Marcus Aurelius is definitely something special, but does that mean that he's a good leader? How effectively can you lead the troops in the battle? The fact is, is that Marcus Aurelius' record there is not good. Marcus's first major battle results in the massacre of 20,000 Romans. It is the worst Roman defeat in a century. Emperor Marcus Aurelius leads his first army to battle against the Germans and fails utterly. Then disaster strikes behind him. While Marcus is bogged down on the Danube, other Germans push into Italy itself. In 170 AD, they pounce upon the rich port town of Aquileia, near modern-day Venice, and ravage it at will. It is the first time in three centuries that barbarians raid the Italian heartland. They're fierce, they're cruel, they're barbarian, and uh, they probably conjure up in the Romans' mind images of the Gauls coming into Rome in the 4th century BC, uh, the threats of the Cimbri and the Teutones in the late 2nd century BC. The Romans particularly fear these individuals coming to Italy. With Rome in the grips of terror, Emperor Marcus Aurelius must act quickly to vanquish the enemy once and for all. He moves with his army north along the Danube and prepares to invade the lands of the powerful Marcomanni tribe. The cold green forests of the north are alien to the Roman emperor. Alone and far from the only home he has ever known, Marcus adjusts poorly to the rugged life of an army officer. His health declines. We know that the famous ancient doctor Galen was Marcus's personal physician for a time. And we know that Galen prepared a medicine for him to take every day, both to treat current illnesses and to stave off future ones. In particular, plague which continues to devastate his troops. With death constantly on his mind, Marcus records his innermost thoughts in a journal known as the Meditations. 
It is still in print today and reveals a man grappling with his fate. Do not act as if you were going to live 10,000 years. Death hangs over you. While you live, while it is in your power, be a decent man. Philosophy gives him a way of dealing with the crises, of dealing with the unpleasant things he has to face on a daily basis along the Danube. The solitude of the deep German woods is a far cry from the chaos and bloodshed Marcus will meet on the battlefield. He launches a series of military strikes in the lands of the most dangerous tribes, the Sarmatians, the Quadi, and the Marcomanni. The barbarians have defeated Marcus before, and remain confident as they set up camp along the river. But Marcus is learning from his enemy. He abandons the established Roman line formation in favor of smaller, more mobile units called vexillations. These give his army greater flexibility as they maneuver through the trees. It was a new war, it was a different war, and it was a war that was far different from some of these veterans who had just fought the Parthians in very straight lines and using conventional tactics um, in the Middle East. This was a war where ambushes were going to be the norm. When the barbarians least suspect it, the Romans swoop in. In the heat of battle, a Roman soldier was on a very dangerous tightrope. He had to balance this incredible adrenaline rush that would lead him to attack. He had to stay calm, even though his hormones are overcoming him. He had to set aside the natural panic that affects anybody when you're going to be only two feet away in a killing zone that's just as dangerous to you as to your enemy. At last, the ailing and inexperienced Emperor Marcus can claim a victory on German soil. The Romans build on their triumph by erecting a line of garrisons in Marcomanni and Quadi territory. The annexation of Germania begins in earnest. But the Germans respond aggressively against the fortifications. Like hornets whose nest has been violated, the barbarians swarm the imperial headquarters in coordinated attacks. The Germans that came out of the forests against Marcus Aurelius are not howling savages dressed in bearskins with wooden shields and big axes like we see in Hollywood. They had been dealing with the Romans now for two centuries. They had learned their techniques, they'd observed their equipment, so they knew how the Romans fought. If they breach the fortress, the Romans know they will destroy everyone inside. Inside the fortress, Marcus Aurelius moves among his men, restoring their spirits and exposing himself to danger. He may well have felt, out of some sense of personal responsibility, of which we would entirely approve, that if he was going to send men to their death in war, that he ought, in fact, to be present, to take an interest, to manage those campaigns. As the situation becomes most critical, Marcus turns to his pagan gods, sacrificing and asking for their help against the German hordes. They answer him with a miracle, according to the fourth century Augustan history. Standing his ground, he prayed to the gods and summoned a thunderbolt from heaven against the enemy. The barbarians, of course, would have seen a thunderbolt as a very negative thing. It seemed that the gods were favoring the Romans in this case, and that's not a good thing, so presumably they would have to deal with that. At the very gates of the fortress, the terrified barbarians break and run. 
the Romans are delivered. Thrilled, the Romans hail Marcus by a new title, Germanicus, the conqueror of the Germans. Through perseverance, discipline, and some say miracles, Emperor Marcus Aurelius takes the upper hand in his brutal conquest of Germania. Even the peaceful German farming communities are not safe from Marcus's wrath. The Romans prove their mastery by the edge of their swords. A lot of these wars against the Germans were genocidal kinds of wars. Romans attacking villages, wiping everyone out, carrying women and children off into slavery. We see soldiers uh, bringing heads of defeated enemies to get rewards. The Romans record the ugliness of the conflict on a towering monument, which commemorates Marcus's German campaigns. It is known as the Aurelian Column. The Marcus Julius column is saying, this is, this is a brutal, nasty business that your emperor is doing for your safety. Um, and this is, this is the cost of it. You know, it's not pleasant. In the German tribal lands, Marcus carves out two new Roman provinces, Marcomania and Sarmatia. But just as they seem to be stabilizing, disturbing news comes from an unexpected quarter, Egypt. Egypt was one of the most important territories in the Roman Empire because it was so rich. There were sort of fears that somebody who controlled Egypt might threaten the entire empire. These fears prove well-founded when Egyptian rebels lead a bloody revolt against their Roman leaders. The terror in the desert only increases. It was definitely a worrying thing. You have to respond to that promptly. Egypt was a huge supplier of grain for Rome itself. So a person who controlled Egypt could put the squeeze on the food supply for the plebs and the populace in the city of Rome, and they would in turn obviously put pressure on the emperor to do something about it. In 174, Marcus sends to Syria, where he has three legions stationed. He directs them to Alexandria, Egypt. At the head of the avenging army rides one of Marcus's oldest and most trusted friends, Avidius Cassius. Marcus Aurelius designated a famous and successful general under his command, Avidius Cassius, to have an overarching command in the eastern half of the empire. Um, um, superordinate to provincial governors. The hero of the Parthian campaign does not disappoint. Avidius puts down the rebellion swiftly, securing the Egyptian territory and its wealth for the empire. But along the empire's northern border in Germania, the enemy is much more elusive. The German campaign seems to go on without end. I mean, he is making progress. But when you drive back one tribe, uh, another one might appear 50 miles up the river, uh, and you have to deal with that. For seven years, Marcus has battled the barbarians in the dense northern forests to the wretched decline of his own health. In 175, he falls ill on the German frontier. Whether it is plague or ulcers, his death seems imminent. His nurse and wife, the Empress Faustina, has stood by him for 20 years. Now she worries about her own future. 
If you're an empress or a princess, it's very clear what happens if the male that you're, that you're attached to dies or falls from grace or is usurped. Then your life expectancy can be reckoned in minutes, along with that of your children. You want to be sure that your husband is doing well and is healthy and is supported. And if he's not, then you need to be thinking about contingencies. Grief overwhelms Faustina. Who will protect her if he dies? She offers her hand and the empire to another noble, Avidius Cassius, the popular commander of the armies in Egypt. Eager to gain the glory he knows he deserves, Avidius leaps at the chance to become emperor. The Augustan History. While Marcus still breathed, Avidius Cassius spread false rumors of his death. Indeed, he told his army that the Senate had already decreed Marcus a god. Then, he declared himself emperor. Avidus may also have felt that it was for the benefit of the people. I mean, Marcus Aurelius was, is considered to be a good emperor, but he was not a strong emperor in many ways. Not necessarily so good in the military arena. Yet just as Avidius claims the throne, Marcus recovers from his illness, putting both men in an impossible position. What do you do? You can't say, listen, I'm sorry about that claim on the throne business. I just, uh, it, it was a bit of a mistake, you know, rush of blood to the head, can we move on? Uh, once you'd staked your claim, you had declared your intention to be emperor. You'd always be suspected from that point on. This was threatening to Marcus Aurelius for a number of reasons. Avidius Cassius was a major military commander in charge of a significant number of troops. And now he intends to take those troops to Rome itself and assert his claim. In 175 AD, embroiled in his German campaign, Emperor Marcus Aurelius is betrayed by a close friend, Avidius Cassius. Shockingly, Avidius is encouraged by Marcus's own wife to claim the throne. Marcus must crush the revolt of Avidius Cassius. He must deal with the betrayal by his wife. But knowing he may die in the struggle to come, he proclaims his own son, Commodus, as his heir. Commodus was not then old enough to be a significant power broker in his own right. Marcus Aurelius does not ever seem to have considered anyone other than his son to succeed him. Having been spoiled in the indulgences of his royal youth, the boy has yet to prove his character or worth as a soldier, but he is Marcus's only son. The choice will not be a good one for Rome. Why did he appoint Commodus? Well, because Commodus was his natural son, and this was the normal way for Roman aristocratic families to think. It had always been the case that Roman upper-class senators and, and aristocrats had promoted themselves over many generations. With his son's position secured, Marcus turns now to the wife who betrayed him to Avidius Cassius. Astonishingly, he forgives her. Marcus did not punish Faustina afterwards. I, uh, he, was, he, he was a very intelligent man and understood perhaps after a heart to heart with her, what her motives were. Um, he didn't uh, in any way put her aside or divorce her or in any way dishonor her. As his troops prepare to march against the armies of Avidius Cassius, a messenger approaches sent by Avidius's soldiers. They have ousted the usurper, hoping to avoid the true emperor's revenge. They know the price of treason. The usual course of action would be for rounds of denunciations, interrogations, tortures, exiles, executions, forced suicides. The messenger bears a grisly gift, the head of Avidius Cassius, once his great friend. 
historian Cassius Dio. Marcus was so greatly grieved at Avidius' death that he could not bring himself to even look at the severed head of his enemy. The rebellion is finished, and Marcus can turn again to the great project of his life, conquering the German barbarians once and for all. The rebellion interrupts his campaign. He has to divert resources, divert troops, uh, shift money, and uh, that causes a disruption in his plan. The barbarians take advantage of such distractions. In 178, Marcus sends in troops to face down a violent band of rebels on the Danube River. Their savagery has only increased. It was so overwhelming to face these barbarians, taller, louder, smelling, looking different, that sometimes you'd have to drink before you went into battle to calm your nerves. Marcus must subdue this enemy, or his years of hard work on the frontier will come to nothing. The aging Marcus isolates the rebel leaders and has them brutally put to death. He believes that just one more season of campaigning will bring the conflict to an end. The German wars of Marcus Aurelius would turn out to be extraordinarily long and protracted, but it was not clear that it was obvious to Marcus or to anyone else that they would be so from the start. Now almost 60, Marcus hopes that his son and heir, Commodus, will carry on his battle against the Germans, a struggle that has taken the best years of his life. Marcus Aurelius had trained Commodus, took him with him on his campaigns, but he was just too young. I don't think Marcus Aurelius uh, fully realized uh, what kind of emperor Commodus would have become. But in his role as co-emperor, the boy has become lazy, with no interest in hard-won victories, as unlike Marcus as a man could be. Still, he is by his father's side when Emperor Marcus Aurelius succumbs at last, probably to the same ruinous plague that claimed his brother. Just 19, Commodus has no patience for warfare and longs for the good life in Rome. He doesn't have the leadership or the vision that his father had, and he pretty much backs off of the campaigns along the Danube long term. It's a very negative thing for Rome. With weak treaties and reduced garrisons, the new emperor, Commodus, abandons Germania, squandering 13 years of struggle and bloodshed to return to the comfort of Rome. Without the vigilance of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman Empire fights a losing battle against the barbarian swarm. I mean, would you have a perfect storm of bad leadership, bad luck and foreign threats, you're in really very deep trouble. What they would discover, not least in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, is that they could not withstand challenges across, across more than, say, a certain number of points along that border at any given time. The tide is turning for Rome. There will never be an emperor like Marcus Aurelius again. According to Dio, it is the beginning of the end. Our history now descends from a kingdom of gold and silver to one of iron and rust. In 160 AD, Rome stands supreme, the lone superpower of the world but peace and prosperity lull the empire into a dangerous complacency. When Rome's enemies sense its weakness, 
Emperor Marcus Aurelius rallies the empire to fight for its very survival. Now, in the third century AD, as the Roman Empire struggles against foreign invasions and the growing power of Christianity, one emperor emerges from the chaos. His name is Decius, a leader who calls upon brutal warfare and ancient pagan gods to deliver Rome from the powerful forces tearing it apart. By the middle of the third century AD, Rome has fallen into a full-blown crisis. Barbarians prey upon the weakening borderlands, and civil war breaks out across the empire. It was a dangerous time, um, and it was a really tension-filled time because the Romans didn't know how they were going to organize their government to provide them the safety and prosperity that they'd grown accustomed to over the past 200 years of Roman peace. Desperate for answers, many Roman citizens looked to their ancient pagan gods to deliver them from the perils of war. But others find solace in a radical new religion, Christianity. Christianity in the middle of the third century is the most rapidly expanding religious movement in the Roman Empire. There's still not a lot of Christians. I mean, let's not think in terms of more than a few hundred thousand but it's a religion which is getting more visible. New believers wash away their old pagan gods through an act described in a second century catechism. Baptize in living water. But if thou hast not living water, then baptize in other water. And if thou art not able in cold, then in warm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In this ritual of purification, Romans are born anew as Christians. Believing in only one true God, they reject the empire's traditional pagan religion. Christians are still trying to figure out how they are going to live successfully and faithfully in a world where they are still a small minority and the majority of the citizens of the empire are not Christian and indeed are believers in the traditional Roman religion with its many gods and goddesses. As outsiders, Christians must rely on the goodwill of the Roman emperor for protection. In 248 AD, Rome's emperor Philip is one of the most tolerant, giving an audience to many local Christian leaders in his imperial palace. Philip was not a great traditionalist. He seems to have been open to discussion with a wide variety of different people, including Christians. He wasn't a Christian himself. That much is very clear. Though Philip may take a genuine interest in this new religion, his trusted general Decius, a resolute pagan, disapproves. The most important thing to realize about Decius is that he's extremely traditional. He's very dedicated to a sort of um, almost mythical view of Roman values. And what that means, of course, is that things that can be perceived as un-Roman uh, are looked at as dangerous by Decius. Decius fears Philip's Christian sympathies will anger the pagan gods, worsening the crisis already enveloping the empire end to end. In Syria and Germania, Roman soldiers launch mutinies, and in Misha, modern-day Bulgaria and Serbia, a vicious new tribe of barbarians, the Goths, have crossed the Danube into the empire itself. This is no time to anger the gods. As the Goths pour into Roman territory, the imperial forces, led by Commander Marinus Pacatianus, must defend the empire against his new and savage enemy. 
the intentions of the Goths perhaps were well known to the Romans, but the extent of their strength and the duration of their attack is something the Romans couldn't have anticipated. Uh, and the degree and the depth to which they penetrate into Roman territory also is something that Romans probably wouldn't have imagined as well. We don't know very much about the Goths in this period. What we do know is that the uh, region north of the Danube became the launching post for hit-and-run raids into the Roman Empire. Pacatianus is able to hold the Goths back and, for the time being, secure the empire's frontier. The Romans at this point were as powerful as a military force as they had ever been. And they were certainly more than prepared to square off against these barbarian peoples. But in their crude camp, the soldiers grow tired of taking orders from a distant ruler. Instead, they choose their commander, Pacatianus, to replace Emperor Philip in Rome. Pacatianus has now become the most dreaded political player, a usurper. A usurper, that is to say, a man who could become emperor through unofficial channels, would gain the throne by getting the support of the army. The support of the army in the end was what made and unmade emperors. The Roman Senate was supposed to give legitimacy to an emperor by recognizing his right to rule, but without the support of the soldiers, no emperor was going to last. As a usurper, Pacatianus is confident that the support of the military will allow him to lead his legions to Rome and take the throne himself. Back in Rome, after learning of the rebellion on the Danube, a desperate Emperor Philip seeks guidance from his general, Decius. Philip senses that not only is his military support eroding, but also his position in Rome is likely to erode. And he knows that this is a, a revolt that he has to deal with personally and he has to deal with quickly. When Philip confronts the Senate and asks them what they would advise him to do about this revolt, um, most of them are too scared to say anything, but Decius actually speaks up and says, let the thing collapse under its own weight. From the Danube region himself, Decius tries to instill confidence in Philip, but in vain. The emperor has good reason to be concerned. Philip would have been particularly worried about Pacatanius because Pacatanius was commanding soldiers to the north in the region of the Danube River where you could expect to find the toughest, most battle-hardened soldiers uh, and the best commanders. So Philip knew that Pacatanius was a real military threat to Philip's political position. Trusting his general Decius completely, Emperor Philip sends him from Rome across the Alps to Mesia to quell Pacatianus' revolt. But even before Decius arrives in Mesia, mutiny breaks out among the soldiers of Pacatianus' camp. The region where Pacatanius had gained his support was under real pressure of attack from barbarians. Pacatanius hadn't been successful in keeping the barbarian attackers from ravaging the region where his army was from. Pacatanius' army wanted to win. Pacatianus is a relatively middling character. Uh, one source actually tells us that Pacatianus wasn't even a very high-ranking military official. Pacatianus is done in. He's, he's killed by his soldiers. And that's, that's the end of the little incident. On his mission to Mesia, General Decius brings his son Herennius, a young soldier in the Roman army. But when Decius arrives, he finds a camp without a leader and soon learns of Pacatianus' fate. Pacatianus' men got rid of him 
I suspect because they heard that Decius was coming to take care of things. And Decius was from that part of the Roman Empire. Uh, he would have been known as a tough, capable, local guy. Decius's claim was that once he had arrived in the Balkans, Pacatianus was overthrown by his own soldiers who had then attached themselves to the cause of Decius. He was then left with a rebellious army that still didn't think that his demands were being met. With Pacantianus murdered, General Decius relishes his new role as leader. He and his son Herennius attempt to restore order to the orphan army. The mutinous soldiers have other plans for Decius. There are very few ways in which an army can actually make its voice heard if it feels that it has grievances. And the basic way that any army can do that is by mutinying, effectively in these cases, going on strike. Demanding a ruler more capable than Philip of protecting the Roman frontier, the soldiers proclaim General Decius Emperor. This makes a lot of sense. He's from the region, generally speaking. He's from the Balkans. And so he's sympathetic to the plight of armies along the Danube. He also, I think, very much senses that when these troops proclaim him emperor, they're willing to fight for him. Uh, they trust him, and he can, he can help them pursue their agenda at court. In an act of utter betrayal, Decius has become a usurper himself, cheered on by his son Herennius. Though Philip is an old friend, Decius sees no other way of returning Rome to its former glory than wresting control of the empire with his own hands. Emperor Philip dispatches his trusted general Decius to suppress a rebellious army in Mesia. But it is Decius who launches a new revolt as his soldiers proclaim him emperor. In Rome, Emperor Philip is enjoying his comfortable imperial life and expects nothing from Decius but news of the rebellion's end. When Philip learns that Decius has been made the new emperor or has been proclaimed emperor by the Danubian legions, uh, Philip has every reason to be very much afraid. And so Philip has to understand that while Decius marches on Italy, Philip has to go out and meet him. He can't stay in the city of Rome and hope to retain his position. Stunned by the deepest betrayal, Philip must now prepare himself to face his former friend and ally. He orders his legions to ready themselves for battle. Philip and his troops ride north from Rome to Verona to confront Decius's army coming from Mesia through the Alps. Emperor Philip and Decius meet in a bloody battle near the Alpine Pass. Once the armies on the Danube have declared him emperor, Decius is in a very powerful position and marches into northern Italy. Philip comes out to meet him. He has a very small army at his disposal. He has the sort of basic strategic reserve of the empire, a couple of legions in Italy, but he's heavily outnumbered. Sixth century chronicler Zosimus records the day. The supporters of Decius, though they knew that the enemy had the imperial forces, still retained their confidence in Decius, trusting his great skill and prudence. The battle would sort of hinge on who would give way first. Morale was a, an incredibly important part of all ancient battles, but especially at this time uh, when there are fewer soldiers, they're less well-trained, uh, and frankly, more susceptible to panic. Panic was the real enemy in an ancient battle. If your side lost its spirit, lost its cohesion, and turned to run, all was lost. Soldiers who had panicked and were running away could be picked off at will without any danger to the enemy. 
When the army is meet in battle, Decius wins a very easy victory. We don't have any precise details, but we have a pretty good idea of what the difference would be in the forces on the two sides, and we can see that Philip really didn't have a chance. In the Battle of Verona, Emperor Philip himself is brutally slain and his army defeated. Victorious, Philip's former general and confidant Decius is now eager to begin his reign as Emperor of Rome. Back in the capital, Decius and his son Herennius are received by the members of the Senate who hail Decius as Emperor. He believes that in order to restore Rome's security, the empire must first uphold its traditional pagan values. One of the things that Decius is very concerned with is the health and the correctness of uh, Roman worship, of imperial worship. I think it's clearly the case that the crisis that the empire is facing, uh, the very large number of civil wars and the very large number of foreign wars, makes a correct relationship with the gods important. Ready to overcome the crises they experienced in Philip's reign, the Senate welcomes the stringent pagan rule of Decius, complete with ritual sacrifice. The traditional religion of the Romans, we call it paganism, uh, involved worshiping and honoring and respecting many gods and goddesses. If the Romans didn't show their respect by sacrificing animals, by really dealing in the blood and meat that literally brought life, then the Romans expected that the gods would abandon them. For the empire at risk for barbarian attacks on almost every border, it seems the gods have already abandoned them. The third century um, in Roman history is often referred to as a period of crisis. And the period when Decius comes to power is uh, just as that crisis is really coming to a head. The situation on the frontiers is about as bad as it's ever been. Barbarian Goths continue to wreak havoc on the Roman borderlands depleting the once powerful Roman armies. In an ancient battle, there was almost no visibility. The noise was tremendous. It was very important to stand one's ground because once a line was broken, it was much harder to defend yourself uh, and defend the person next to you. And once a line was broken and your enemy started um, coming around to your side, uh, it was very easy for a massacre to start. The northern frontiers, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, a number of peoples who had once been controlled, contained along the frontiers, um, are now attempting to move into the empire. This is extremely dangerous from Rome. If something isn't done, the borders of the empire will collapse completely. To start, new pagan temples are commissioned by Emperor Decius in Rome, hoping to appease the angry gods. Naming his son Herennius co-emperor, Decius sets out to impose their traditional values on the entire empire. They will not tolerate Christianity or any other deviation from pagan devotion. The Romans very much believed in the power of the past. And that meant that when Decius decided to undertake a major religious reform, he simply looked back to the past. How have we always done things? We've always performed sacrifices. I'll ask the people to perform a sacrifice. In temples across the empire, all Roman citizens are required to follow Emperor Decius's decree and make public sacrifices to the gods of Rome. The central activity of traditional Roman religion revolved around sacrifice, which is, after all, involved with life and death uh, you know, in the most immediate and even brutal fashion. You kill an animal and you cook it 
in order to show your respect to the gods and to literally share the stuff of life. For Romans, sacrifice was absolutely essential to ensuring what they called our peace with the gods. Emperor Decius demands that every Roman take part, regardless of religion. What he did was insist that every single person make the sacrifice and obtain a certificate that they had done so. He was able to use the tax system, the tax rolls, to make sure that you could bring everybody in, and you had to make the sacrifice in front of witnesses. Anyone who does not submit documentation proving their sacrifice risks imprisonment or even death. This created terrible problems for Christians. Do they simply do this? Do they make the sacrifice or do they refuse? If they refuse, what is gonna to happen to them? They're violating a direct order from the emperor. The citizens of Rome, Christian and pagan, await an uncertain future. After Decius slays Emperor Philip in battle, he sets out to strengthen the troubled empire against the growing Christian population. The pagan Decius and his son Herennius begin by issuing strict orders compelling everyone to sacrifice. Emperor Decius proclaims that all Christians, on pain of torture and death, must make sacrifices to the pagan gods, even though their faith forbids it. Christians couldn't sacrifice to the traditional gods without forsaking their religion and believing that they were doomed to eternal damnation. Forced to obtain a certificate to prove their sacrifice, Christians face an impossible choice between their emperor and their religion. How could they remain loyal subjects and also make sacrifice to what they regarded as demons. Some Christians find ways out of this. We know of Christians who paid bribes to obtain a certificate on sacrifice without actually having made the sacrifice. We know that other Christians did actually make the sacrifice. They can only hope that their God will forgive such transgressions in these difficult times. But not all Christians comply with Emperor Decius's decree. In 250 AD, Fabian, the Bishop of Rome himself, shows the people of Rome the earthly consequences of an unbending Christian faith. It's quite possible Decius didn't understand that Christians couldn't perform these sacrifices. But in effect, by requiring that everyone in the empire act religiously in the same way, Christians are now excluded. And the penalty that Decius set out for not performing these sacrifices is a severe penalty, uh, in some cases extending even to death. Fourth century Christian chronicler Eusebius of Caesarea writes of the Christians martyred during the third century persecutions. I am struck with wonder at their all enduring courage and the open profession of their faith how the martyrs were not cast down in their minds, but their eyes looked upwards, and they neither trembled nor feared. Third century Christian chronicler Lactanius raves against the emperor. Decius appeared in the world an accursed wild beast to afflict the church, and who but a bad man would persecute religion? As the religious fervor escalates, Many Christians cannot find the same strength as the martyrs. They choose instead to keep their heads down and try to stay alive. But in 250 AD, no one is safe from the scourge of angry gods as a deadly, uncontrollable plague sweeps the empire. We don't know that much about the plague um, from a medical perspective, but we don't know precisely which kind of plague it was, whether it was the bubonic plague or something else. Not even the empire's most innocent are spared from the plague's blight. Oh, 
The disease ravages the empire. At its height between 251 and 266 AD, killing thousands a day in the city of Rome alone. There were no really strong antibiotics. There were some plants, uh, you know, even onions have a mild antibiotic effect. But in the face of plagues, especially which could be viral, there was no defense. You could be healthy one day and at death's door the next. Even the emperor is powerless against such a virulent enemy. I think Decius would have been distressed to find that even after he tried to have this universal sacrifice, that things got even worse, especially when the plague hit subsequently. You have bodies decomposing and pieces of bodies. The city's littered with the dead. Uh, the living are, of course, affected immensely by this. And the living begin to wonder about their fate and the fate of the empire, and ultimately the cause of such suffering. Across the empire, Christians fear for their safety as pagan Romans blame the outsiders for what they see as a divine punishment. They looked for a scapegoat, naturally, and one of the scapegoats that they found was the Christians, and it's therefore likely that the plague played a role in initiating the desire for a persecution. In a desperate form of retribution, the pagans hope the Christian blood will appease their angry gods. The locals decided to turn upon the Christians in their area, um, and they um, literally slaughtered their next door neighbors, um, one by one, systematically hunted them down, uh, ferreted them out, put them on trial, and killed them. The persecutions weaken many Christian communities throughout the empire. Even the small Christian community of Ephesus in modern-day Turkey bears witness to the violence. 13th century chronicler Jacobus de Voragine records, When Decius the emperor came into Ephesus, he sought out the Christians, commanding them to make sacrifice or to be put to death. Upon finding seven Christian men who refuse his edict, Decius orders a cruel punishment depicted in both Christian and Islamic medieval manuscripts. Decius enclosed them in a cave sealed with stones so that they should die within its walls out of hunger for lack of food. The legend has the seven martyrs sleeping in the cave for 208 years, only waking when a Christian emperor rules over Rome. Many of the empire's Christians flee to the wilderness, hoping to avoid persecution. There were important figures who tried to escape martyrdom by fleeing, and this was not necessarily frowned on by the church. The church um, did not encourage people actively to seek martyrdom. If you wish to preserve your church community and preserve your own life, it was acceptable for you to try to run out into the countryside. The most unfortunate of the refugees are left vulnerable to attack by the scavenging barbarian tribes who prey upon those along the weak borders of the empire. The Roman Empire had no police force. When you left your community, uh, you literally didn't have any kind of automatic protection. There was no 911 to call in the Roman Empire if you were attacked, so Christians suffered miserably, I'm sure, when they had to flee the sinners in order to avoid sacrificing. The fourth century Christian chronicler Eusebius of Caesarea recounts the journey of a fleeing Christian. One man fled with his wife to the mountains, never to return. And of the Christian brethren searched diligently. They could not find either them or their bodies. And many who fled to the same mountain were carried into slavery by the barbarians. 
the empire appears even more chaotic now than when the hopeful Decius was crowned. First angry gods, then plague, and now barbarians are about to threaten the future of the civilized world. Emperor Decius struggles as the empire's defenses are weakened by civil unrest and plague, allowing invading barbarians to threaten Rome's borderlands. In 250 AD, the barbarian Goths again crossed the Danube into the imperial province of Mesia. The Goths are now led by the mighty chieftain Caniva, who enjoys the security of a loyal tribe. The way in a, a man like Caniva would secure his position was by rewarding his followers, by giving them a chance to, to get rich. There was only uh, so much wealth north of the river, north of the Danube. South of the river, where, the, um, where there are Roman cities, there's an almost limitless supply of captives, of treasure, of coined money. Sixth century chronicler Jordanes recounts the Gothic king's plan to relieve the empire of its abundant wealth. Geneva divided the army into two parts, and while he stayed in camp with 70,000 men on the Danube, he sent the other warriors to waste Misha, knowing that it was undefended through the neglect of their emperor. In the rural villages of Misha, the Roman citizens have no warning before the sudden violent attack of the Goths. This is a group that's very much devoted to plunder and probably also the seizing of captives. So Romans would have seen in this uh, an incursion of a, a very large and well-organized group very much determined to take whatever they could get their hands on and destroy what they couldn't take with them. One advantage that the Goths have, actually, once they get within the empire, is that there's an excellent road system along the Danube, that, which they know will lead them to the cities that they want to sack, so they can take the plunder back north of the river, and the chief will become a more famous and more powerful chief. With the Goths now raiding within the empire's borders, they must be stopped at all costs before they reach the heart of Rome itself. Emperor Decius quickly prepares for battle and takes no chances in planning his attack on the Goths. His oldest son, Herennius, will join him in Mesia, but his younger son, Hostilian, only a boy, will remain behind. Hostilian is left in Rome with his mother. The rationale for this, I think, is relatively clear. If the situation in Rome requires an imperial presence, Hostilian can represent the uh, principate there. Uh, but it's a way of trying to divide the imperial presence and secure Decius's authority throughout the empire. If Decius and Herennius fail to survive their mission, the entire weight of the Roman Empire will fall on the shoulders of young Hostilian. Emperor Decius and Herennius travel from Rome eastward to face Caniva and the Goths at Nicopolis at Istrum on the Danube River in Mesia. Outside Nicopolis, the Gothic king Caniva and his barbarian warriors prepare to besiege the Roman city. Geneva is clearly a very able character on a tactical level, but he doesn't have a strategic plan rather than to sort of smash, grab, and return, which is what the tribes see Rome as being, a place to go steal cool stuff and bring it home. Emperor Decius and Herennius intercept the Goths just in time before they can reach Nicopolis. Well, you're in ancient warfare, in a, in a battle between Romans and barbarians, you were you were face to face with the person you were fighting. You were face to face with the person that you were trying to kill, and um, the battles often didn't last very long for the simple reason that it was very tiring. It was very tiring, and after the initial impact, uh, people wore out very quickly. 
Sixth century chronicler Jordanes describes Caneva's defeat. When the Emperor Decius drew near, Neva with his army, still in good shape, at last withdrew to the Hamus Mountains of the Balkans, which were not far distant. But the persistent Goths do not continue their retreat and instead move south into the Thracian city of Philippopolis. The Goths terrorize the land surrounding Philippopolis, brutally abducting the Roman women to be sold into slavery. The Goths that erupt are a very well organized force. Uh, their, their king doesn't command a small war band. It seems that he commands a relatively large army of thousands. And this makes him different from previous Germanic invaders in the Danube region. So this is going to be a moment of profound fear. Kniva managed to besiege Philippopolis and eventually take it in ruthless fashion. He did this and killed, according to one source, as many as 100,000 people in the process. But despite his campaign, Kniva finds an unlikely ally inside the city walls. Titus Julius Priscus, an ambitious Roman governor who would prefer to be emperor. Caneva lures Priscus into making a traitorous pact. He allows Caneva into Philippopolis in exchange for barbarian support against a shared enemy, Emperor Decius. Both Priscus and Caneva had the goal of bringing down the Roman emperor. Priscus from the inside, Caneva from the outside. And so Priscus made a secret dirty deal saying, look, I'll surrender our people to you if you'll promise to get rid of the ones who'd support the emperor instead of me. And Caneva said, that's a deal. The two leaders sealed the deal with a common act for both barbarian and Roman. Priscus and Caneva uh, would have had a formal ceremony in which they swore before the gods over a sacrifice, pouring a libation of wine to the gods to show each other that their faith was guaranteed uh, by divine sanction. In this case, Caneva was lying. Priscus will learn soon enough, it's all a ruse. The Goths take what they need, supplies and captives, and brutally dispose of what's left. Emperor Decius has driven the Goths back, but in 250 AD, their king Caneva tricks a Roman governor into surrendering his city, provoking a face-off with Decius and his imperial army. After the Goths plunder and desert Philippopolis, Emperor Decius pursues the fleeing king Caneva northward to Abritus in Roman Mesia. In their camp outside of Britis, Decius, his son Herennius, and their legion's priest turn to the only force they know will guarantee victory, their beloved pagan gods. Decius knew that this was gonna be the struggle of his life. So Decius did what he was supposed to do to win the favor of the gods, he sacrificed. And with the smoke rising to the heavens, as far as the eye could see on and around the altars, then no one could doubt that Decius had done absolutely the maximum to try to win this titanic struggle. Sixth century chronicler Jordanes remembers the sacred place of worship outside the modern Bulgarian city of Rosgrad. To this day, that place is still called the altar of Decius because there he had offered amazing sacrifices to idols before the battle. If Decius is going to bring stability to Rome, he must push the Goths back across the Danube River for good. Finally, in 251 AD, Decius's army confronts the Gothic forces at the Battle of Abritus. The terrain is wet and difficult for the highly organized Roman army who falter against their barbarian enemy. I 
think Decius really thought that he was going to finish off Kniva finally. But instead, Kniva was able to uh, surprise him with the number of troops that he had who were hidden in these marshes, and then also to outmaneuver him on a type of battlefield that just didn't work well for Roman fighters. The Gothic forces soon overpowered Decius's army. The sixth century chronicler Jordanes recounts the emperor's greatest loss. In the battle that followed, the Goths quickly pierced Herennius, the son of Decius, with an arrow and cruelly slew him. When his son, Herennius Etruscus, takes an arrow and is dying on the battlefield, um, Decius doesn't break down. Instead, he proclaims, let no one be afraid. The loss of one soldier is no diminution to the state. Um, as if he didn't care, as if it didn't matter to him at all. Decius dismounts his horse and furiously charges into battle. But this time, his pagan gods cannot save him, according to 6th century Byzantine scholar Zosimus. Decius and his army were so assailed by the missiles of the barbarians that not one of them escaped with his life. Thus ended the life of the excellent emperor, Decius. Decius is the first emperor in Roman history to be killed by a barbarian army. It's a moment where the Roman Empire probably seems to its inhabitants to be beginning to careen out of control. And the loss of an emperor, especially one who seems to be as effective as Decius uh, in this sort of circumstance, has profound implications. Uh, it must contribute in a very significant way to a loss of a sense of security that the Romans would feel. Though some say the emperor's body is never found, the fourth century Christian chronicler Lactanius describes Decius's ultimate end. Stripped and naked, he lay to be devoured by wild beasts and birds, a fit end for the enemy of God. Back in Rome, the plague has taken the ultimate toll as Decius's heir, Hostilian, is struck with the disease not long after his father's death. The death of an emperor and of his son were signs that the gods' favor had been lost. Romans would have been filled with tension, wondering how are we going to regain the lost divine favor? <laughs> with Emperor Decius and his son's deaths, the crisis of the third century only worsens. Usurpers revolt in Gaul, barbarians continue to attack the empire's northern borders, and to the east, territory is lost to foreign invaders as well. Yet Christianity continues to grow, despite an increase in persecutions. Decius's experiment with persecution was um, a failure. In the decades that follow, there's only one other sustained attempt at persecution. And then for more than 40 years, the Christian church is allowed to grow at, um, at, its, at its own pace. Eventually, over 100 years later, in 380 AD, Christianity becomes the official state religion of the Roman Empire, an apt reward for their faith and courage, according to fourth century chronicler Eusebius of Caesarea. Anyone who examines the events of history will find that all those who have acted on the side of the righteous and the just have tasted the sweet fruit of success. Emperor Decius allowed religion to divide the empire, turning Roman against Roman in a desperate time of violence and plague. Without a unified front, Rome's borders are left open to the greatest and bloodiest of all enemies, the barbarians. When the empire is attacked by foreign invaders and a deadly plague, Roman citizens blame the new religion of Christianity for angering the empire's pagan gods. Desperate, Emperor Decius turns to violence 
sacrificing the lives of Christians to win back the God's favor. Now, threatened by barbarian attacks on all fronts, the people of Rome live in constant fear. As the crisis deepens, insurgents seize control, dividing the empire against itself. Until a new ruler emerges. His name is Aurelian, and he unifies the fractured empire using its greatest reservoir of strength, the army. By the middle of the third century, the Roman Empire is huge and relies on distant, isolated legions to protect every far-flung province. The troops at this point were forced into a situation where they often had to rely on self-help. The imperial superstructure was very far away from them. Emperors made it to frontier conflicts often after they had mushroomed entirely out of control. In the absence of the emperor, the soldiers sometimes take leadership matters into their own hands. The emperor can't be there, so there's a bit of drift, and so somebody arises who is able to do the job for him and probably will call themselves an emperor in order to rally local support, to beat back the barbarians who are threatening the integrity of the provinces. Having dared to raise their own emperors, the powerful border armies now declare independence from Rome. As these armies break away on the eastern and western frontiers, forming their own empires, Rome's northern frontier is attacked by the Alemanni barbarians in 269 AD. In his palace in Rome, the true Roman emperor, Claudius II, is troubled by this devastating assault on Roman soil. Enemies from the other side of the Alps did more than invade the Roman Empire. For the first time in an extraordinarily long time, they actually crossed the Alps into Italy. Claudius seeks the advice of his powerful cavalry commander, Aurelian, a man whose military discipline is described by the third century historian, Vulpiscus. Aurelian, from his earliest years, was very quick of mind and famous for his strength. He never let a day go by without practicing the spear, the bow and arrow, and other weaponry. Aurelian's skills will soon be tested as news from the frontier worsens. Distraught refugees from northern Italy bear witness to the devastation. With this invasion, the danger of a mutiny within the army becomes even greater. If a barbarian people threaten to invade, then the local people would simply proclaim emperor whoever happened to be the military commander in the region at the time. In order to keep the northern frontier from breaking away as well, Claudius must act quickly to stop the encroaching Alemanni forces. In the Alemanni camp, the barbarians celebrate, reveling in the rich spoils taken easily from a weakened Roman Empire, including Roman women and children they intend to use as slaves. We've got inscriptions, actually, which talk to us, which tell us about uh, parties of raiders who've gone into Italy and taken lots of prisoners. So it's sort of easy pickings to some extent for these raiders. They're preying on an empire that is not at its peak at this time. The groups of Alemanni are led by powerful chieftains who ensure their warriors' loyalty by rewarding them with slaves of Roman blood. But the barbarians' greed knows no end.
Emperor Claudius is forced to march his army from Rome, meeting the Alemanni warriors at Lake Garda in northern Italy. Claudius and his men face a brutal enemy, fourth century historian Ammianus Marcellinus. Rushing forward with more haste than caution, they threw themselves on our squadrons of horse with horrible grinding of teeth and more than their usual fury. Their hair streamed behind them and a kind of madness flashed from their eyes. Emperor Claudius is also severely outnumbered, but he has a secret weapon at his side, the powerful cavalry commander, Aurelian. He was known as Manu ad ferum, that is sort of hand ready to the sword, ready to leap into action when that should be necessary. True to his name, Aurelian helps Claudius beat back the Alemanni, killing half their force and driving the rest back over the Alps. And in an effort to better secure Italy from future barbarian attacks, Emperor Claudius and Aurelian travel to the Balkans to increase the military presence there. But while on campaign, Emperor Claudius contracts the plague. Claudius's reign was short. Um, he ruled from 268 to 270. He had a signal military success in the year 269 heavily advertised at the time and much talked about later. But this success, the defeat of the Alemanni, is not enough to restore the empire. As Emperor Claudius's life slips away, it is clear that this task must fall on his trusted general, Aurelian. He is declared emperor by his troops. Aurelian repays them by sacrificing to the god of soldiers, Sol Invictus, the unconquered son, a deity now emerging as the god of victory within the army. Whatever gives you the victory, whatever it is that's going to be beneficial, that's the, that's the, the, the wagon, as it were, you hitch your star to. A man of low birth, Aurelian now rises to the highest position in the empire because of his military brilliance, like many great generals before him. You can't be a civilian emperor by the middle of the third century. You have to lead troops in battle. There's always some place where you've got to go and fight. Aurelian will need the loyalty of the soldiers and the strength of their god as he faces a familiar enemy. In 271 AD, the bloodthirsty Alemanni return, ravaging northern Italy and making it as far as Piacenza. Aurelian and his army race west to cut off the barbarians, sending ahead an offer to negotiate. But the Alemanni have other plans. He invited uh, the barbarians to uh, give themselves up, but uh, reportedly they uh, uh, replied that they were free men and they could show him how free men can fight. Um, sure enough, at dusk, uh, at in the wooded area south of Piacenza, uh, they ambushed the Roman army, uh, which uh, suffered heavy losses. In the forest, the Roman soldiers are no match for the barbarians. Why was an ambush uh, such a successful tactics against Roman, Roman troops? And you know, largely the answer lies in the form of organization of the Roman armies. They were trained, you know, the discipline consisted in training them to actually fight in a line, in a formation. Um, and it, it evidently can do so only when uh, the conditions are met where you can develop that formation, uh, which is not the case in an wooded area. Needless to say, the barbarians knew that. Caught in a wooded trap, the Roman army is thrown into confusion and routed. For Aurelian, the defeat is devastating. The troops are 
in some ways very loyal to their own commanders, but they're also very fickle. So if, a, if an emperor is winning, they are happy to support him. Once an emperor starts to lose, then he's almost certainly uh, done for. Aurelian rallies what troops have survived, praying that they will remain loyal. He needs them now more than ever to keep the Alemanni from reaching the city of Rome. When Rome's frontier armies break away from the rest of the empire, Emperor Aurelian's legions are left helpless against the fierce Alemanni barbarians now heading into the heart of Italy. Terror grips the people of Rome as they fear the barbarians' arrival is imminent. Desperate, many flee the city. The defeat of the Roman army or Aurelian's army created panic in Rome uh, because there was no serious force to stand between the barbarians and the city. Those unable to escape riot in the streets, enraged by Aurelian's failure to keep the barbarians out of Italy. The population of Rome does seem to have understood that becoming a vast city in the midst of an empire whose armies were concentrated at the frontier left them, as it were, peculiarly vulnerable if an army were actually to make it into Italy. But before the Alemanni warriors can reach the capital, Aurelian is finally able to cut them off at Fanum, 180 miles from Rome. After his recent defeat, Aurelian must win back his army's loyalty with nothing less than absolute victory. Emperors had always relied upon the support of the army. And emperors may have presented themselves as champions of the republic, but the reality, the underlying reality of imperial power is it always depends upon the army. Together, Aurelian and his soldiers teach their barbarian foes a lesson in Roman discipline. They learned now that whenever there was an opportunity for the Roman army to develop in tight for or mission, they, they had no chance. Overwhelmed, many barbarian warriors die a watery death in the Metaurus River. Aurelian's victory drives the Alemanni from Italy at last. It's also regaining confidence, and no doubt his triumph served to boost morale at a time when it had been greatly shaken. But Aurelian's hard-won triumph in Italy is quickly overshadowed by news of rising conflict from the city of Palmyra, on the empire's eastern frontier. For more than 10 years, beginning well before Aurelian's reign, foreign invaders struck hard against Rome's eastern provinces, including Palmyra, threatening to break through the weakening border. And this ongoing flow of populations, some of whom were highly militarized and used quite different tactics than the Romans were used to, caused very profound problems in the eastern provinces. On the edges of the Syrian desert, far from the protection of Rome, the people of Palmyra have faced the devastation of their army alone these opponents, they also are taking advantage of the absence of the emperor to take over, to roll back the frontiers, which they do successfully, and to make, uh, to extort payments from the Romans. Counting the bodies of their dead, the Palmarines finally grew weary of waiting for help from a distant Rome. These people in these various areas who are threatened by invasion, they wish they were better protected. So they call upon local defenders to take on the role that the emperors seem unable to do because the emperors can't be everywhere. In a blatant act of revolt, 
the Pomerine army took matters into its own hands. As a result, for the past decade, the eastern provinces have called themselves the Pomerine Empire, breaking away from Rome. Now they make a direct threat against Emperor Aurelian by taking the fertile Roman land of Egypt. The rich Egyptian granaries are now controlled by the Pomerine Queen. Her name is Zenobia. We are fascinated by this figure of uh, uh, a woman of the East wielding such control, uh, perhaps a latter-day Cleopatra type. And incidentally, I mean, she did try to associate herself with Cleopatra when they took over Egypt. She sought to sort of establish a connection in order to reconcile the Egyptians to her rule. With Egypt under her thumb, Zenobia basks in her power ordering the granaries to stop shipments of grain to Rome, cutting off one of the empire's main sources of food. Italy was, of course, the affective heart of the empire. It was where the empire began. But Africa and Egypt had long been the breadbasket of the empire. That's where the agricultural wealth was concentrated. Queen Zenobia, with her loyal general Zubdis at her side, now holds the empire's grain hostage, sending a clear message to Rome that the Palmarines are powerless no more. Zenobia's power play strikes deep. In Rome, Aurelian finds the people desperate and starving for lack of grain. Though he orders his troops to share their bread with the masses, it is not enough. Naturally, Egypt was the granary of Rome, and therefore any interruption to the grain supplies to Rome was a huge threat to any emperor, particularly one who had already had strife to deal with in Rome. The threat of famine leaves Romans restless and angry. Having lost territory to the armies of the East and West, the empire now faces rebellion in Rome itself. Having relieved Rome of the Alemanni barbarian threat, Emperor Aurelian faces a new crisis when the Palmyrene usurper, Queen Zenobia, stops shipments of Egyptian grain to Rome, threatening the city with starvation. Soon the Romans turn against their Emperor Aurelian. The violence, by the way, that uh, uh, this rebellion sparked was on a level not seen uh, since Republican times. Aurelian has no choice but to unleash his own savage warriors against the insurgents. You're fighting in Rome itself. You know, and this is civil war. This is something the Romans also uh, fear because they know how divisive it can be and how uh, devastating it can be. Unaccustomed to battling inside a city, Aurelian soldiers struggle. Though virtually unbeatable on open battlefield, the Roman army once again shows its weakness when tight formation cannot be maintained. The actual war, not the struggle itself, would have been in an urban context. And of course, for the Roman soldiers involved at Aurelian's disposal, uh, this must have been highly unusual. I mean, ancient uh, battles were not typically urban struggles, street by street fighting, and this is where your trained soldiers would have greater difficulty. But in the end, Aurelian puts down the revolt decisively. The fourth century historian Eutropius. Aurelian suppressed them with the utmost severity. Several noblemen he condemned to death. He was indeed cruel and bloodthirsty and rather an emperor necessary for the times than an amiable one. Aurelian executes the rebel leaders, reminding the people of Rome that he is their ruler. The emperor has crushed the resistance. 
he now rebuilds the city walls against external forces. Rome will be strong and safe in his hands. In the aftermath of the military crisis in northern Italy, at the start of his reign, the Emperor Aurelian provided that the city of Rome should be outfitted with a new set of walls. This was the first significant, really significant, new set of walls built for the city of Rome since nearly a thousand years before. Aurelian now turns to the crisis of the Palmyrene Empire. He must secure his grain supply in order to avoid famine in Rome. His dwindling bread rations will not last forever. Well, Aurelian uh, was determined to reassert control over all areas of the empire. And so he moves east in uh, 272 to regain control. His first target is the former Roman city of Antioch, then part of the larger region called Syria. Antioch is a bustling city, invaluable to Rome as a wealthy center of trade. But now, under the control of the Palmyrene Empire, it becomes a safe haven for the fugitive queen, Zenobia. Zenobia and her generals knew for sure that Antioch would be the first city, the first thing Aurelian would have to conquer upon entering Syria. So she barricaded herself in the city, and Zabdas drew uh, the army uh, in the Orontes Plain to the west of Lake Antioch. Zenobia enjoys her prestige, happy to let her generals ready themselves for war just outside the city walls. There, Zenobia's general Zubdis meets Aurelian's army on the battlefield. You have walls of Romans moving in lines, man to man, fist to fist. You can't kill somebody until you look them in the eye. Um, you've got arms getting cut off, hands getting cut off, uh, damage to, to, to the neck, to the face. But as his infantrymen fall prey to the swords of the Palmyrenes, Aurelian knows his only chance is to outmaneuver General Zubdis. It is during this battle that Aurelian uh, instructed his highly disciplined light cavalry to perform what later came to be known as the feigned retreat strategy. Aurelian's light cavalry pretends to flee tricking the Palmyrenes into giving chase, leaving the protection of the main lines behind them. At which point the Roman cavalry turned back and cut them to pieces. In any case, indeed, the Palmyrian cavalry was destroyed and uh, the road was open to Antioch. General Zabdis orders the surviving Palmyrene troops to retreat. Zenobia and her generals head toward Palmyra. Aurelian gives chase, determined to catch the queen before she reaches her home city. But in the Syrian desert, Aurelian faces unexpected obstacles. You have to remember this is summer. It's hot in the desert. Uh, so harassed by both uh, the hot summer and the Arabs, uh, Arab nomads that uh, had remained uh, loyal to Zenobia, Aurelian and his army pursued or, or pushed to Palmyra. But an arrow wound delays Aurelian's pursuit, giving Zenobia time to secure herself in Palmyra. Cursing his nomad attackers, Aurelian vows to capture their queen. In 272 AD, Emperor Aurelian defeats Zenobia's army at Antioch. But in pursuit of the fleeing queen, Aurelian is ambushed, allowing her to reach the safety of Palmyra. Now ordered to surrender by Aurelian, who has besieged the city, Zenobia writes him a scathing rebuke in the spirit of her model, Cleopatra. Whatever must be accomplished in matters of war must be done by valor alone. You demand my surrender? 
as though you were not aware that Cleopatra preferred to die a queen rather than remain alive, however high her rank. Despite her bravado, the proud queen knows she is not safe for long in the city. She quickly packs for travel. Palmyra itself is not really ready for a siege anyway. They built some very hastily erected defenses and clearly Aurelian has some support inside the city. It does not hold out for very long. Queen Zenobia and her general Zubdis slip away into the cover of darkness, eluding Aurelian again. In 272 AD, Zenobia races toward Persia, making it as far as the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. But Aurelian's soldiers are in hot pursuit. On the banks of the Euphrates, the queen offers the boatman gold to cross the river, but even her desperate threats are too late to save her. She was uh, intercepted and captured by the Roman cavalry. They took Zenobia, her advisors and generals, as prisoners of war and put them on trial. Bound to prevent escape, Zenobia knows she will soon face Aurelian. Having won back the throne of Palmyra, Aurelian finally confronts the rebel Zenobia, a woman whose boldness he can't help but admire. In his own words, What manner of woman she is, how wise in counsels, how steadfast in plans, how firm toward the soldiers, how generous when necessity calls, and how stern when discipline demands. But facing likely execution, Zenobia's courage begins to wane. Zenobia pleaded that she had been led astray by bad advice, on which account her advisor was put to death, and so was the General Zabdas. Aurelian has a different fate in mind for the beautiful queen once they reach Rome. But before leaving Palmyra, Aurelian visits a temple where he will pay tribute to one god alone, the god of soldiers, Sol Invictus, who has ensured his victory on foreign soil. He clearly uh, had in mind an alliance between him and uh, uh, the, the sun god that was responsible for uh, his successes in, in Palmyra. He um, uh, presented himself on his coins uh, in terms of an association with, of the emperor to the god, Sol Invictus. Well, we're moving into this uh, dimension of uh, of associating the emperor very closely with one particular divinity, who clearly, uh, uh, given the success that Aurelian had enjoyed, people might believe in. In the peace of the Eastern Temple, he sees that this is the one god to unite all of Rome. He does seem to have been participating in a growing trend toward universalism, both in religion and in Roman political control. Offering his own blood as sacrifice, Aurelian promises his god a nation of worshipers. Having taken back the East and restored Rome's ration of free bread, Aurelian is welcomed back to Rome, a hero. It may have signaled to the Romans an end to what had been nearly a half century of sequence of military catastrophe, followed by recovery, followed by catastrophe, followed by illusory recovery again. Aurelian has another purpose in Rome. He will use the riches taken from the East to establish the soldier's god, Sol Invictus, as the single deity of the empire. Work soon begins on a new temple. 
He actually put the new cult on a par with the official, uh, official state religion in Rome. He built a magnificent temple for Saul in Rome, which he furnished with the spoils from Palmyra. But religion must wait for now. Aurelian has more battles to fight before the empire is fully restored. To the north, the Roman territories of Gaul and Britain have fallen under the unlawful rule of a mutinous Roman army that calls their dominion the Gallic Empire. Resembling their barbarian foes more every day, the Gallic soldiers scorn Roman honor, naming the arrogant Roman general Tetricus their emperor. You have armies popping up all over the place, proclaiming their general's emperor, and then they have to fight, and whoever wins is the one who ends up being the, uh, the legitimate emperor in the end. The separation of the Gallic Empire was, of course, frightening for uh, Romans. It was a, a major loss. It was, it was uh, humiliating to have such a significant portion of the traditional Roman Empire in another man's hands. Emperor Aurelian quickly moves to take back the Gallic lands and restore the empire to its former glory. All that stands in his way is Tetricus and the Gallic army. Having defeated Queen Zenobia and recovered the east, Aurelian now vows to take back the lost territory in the west from the usurper Tetricus and unite all Romans under one god, Sol Invictus, warrior god of the soldiers. In 274 AD, the mutinous Gallic Empire encompasses both Gaul and Britain. There, the soldier emperor Tetricus and his army have become indistinguishable from their barbarian enemies. Undisciplined, they revel in the torment of their prisoners. The job of soldier emperor was tremendously dangerous because they're in power only because they are proclaimed by their troops. But it's a very difficult thing once in power to maintain that because you have to avoid internal conflicts with other potential generals who see themselves as possible emperors. Tetricus cannot show any weakness to his troops. But in the privacy of his palace, Tetricus consults his advisors, trying to determine where his next rival will come from. Tetricus himself had survived over the pre previous several years uh, a number of internal disputes, some actually leading to considerable bloodshed among rival leaders in the Gauls. He plans to someday leave his kingdom to his son, establishing a dynasty in his own name. But reports of a new challenger now threaten to destroy this dream. It seems to have been clear to him that in the aftermath of his success in the East, Aurelian was going to and was already marching on Gaul in an attempt to reintegrate Gaul into the Roman Empire. With news of Aurelian's approach, the volatile Tetricus blames his advisors, lashing out at everyone around him. In 274 AD, Aurelian marches to Chalon, Gaul, in modern-day France, to face Tetricus and win back the western territories for Rome. Aurelian and his men meet Tetricus in the forests of Chalon, where the fighting is fierce. Aurelian's army uh, probably contained more cavalry than traditional imperial armies had up until now. As for Tetricus's army, uh, well, there were still important uh, 
legions along the Rhine uh, guarding these areas. It would have been a battle between forces much uh, similar for forces with similar equipment at their disposal and therefore all the bloodier and uh, more devastating for the armies involved. It is Tetricus's army that now bears the brunt of Aurelian's vengeance. Having dared to name another as their emperor, it is they who remain the greatest threat. Part of the crisis of the third century is the importance that the army plays in choosing an emperor. Uh, this is something that's relatively new in the Roman world, um, and it's a result of, of constant warfare. The army becomes more powerful, it becomes more able to choose emperors, and it becomes more able to impose its own choice of emperors on Rome itself. Aurelian cannot allow this affront to his power. As Tetricus's army falters, Aurelian orders his troops to cut them down, showing no mercy. Some sources claim that Tetricus realized the game was up even before the battle, but it looks as though he did fight it out to the end, and uh, it was, in the end, Aurelian who gained the victory. It is the culmination of his efforts to reunite the empire. In the end, he takes the usurper Tetricus prisoner. And as with Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, Emperor Aurelian spares Tetricus's life. And for Tetricus too, it was uh, surprising that, uh, uh, particularly an opponent in civil war, opponents in civil wars were usually, you know, usually represented a, a great danger. They might, after all, turn against you later. So Aurelian displayed remarkable clemency in sparing the lives of both of these opponents. Tetricus's Gallic army is not so lucky for it is they who have raised a rival emperor in the West, and now they will pay the ultimate price for their treason. Aurelian was a great disciplinarian, uh, it seems. He tolerated no uh, mutinies on the part of soldiers. He drove them hard, but was respected by them. To maintain his own soldiers' respect, Aurelian knows his punishment of the captured Gallic soldiers must be brutal and complete. Not one is spared. Aurelian was both a successful military commander and in some respects, as perhaps one had to be, a fairly savage one. And yet, his treatment of Tetricus was remarkably generous. It is in this generous spirit that Aurelian returns victorious to Rome. There, after four years of nonstop campaigning, Aurelian celebrates his reunification of the empire with a spectacular triumph parade, displaying high-ranking captives from every far-off conquest there's all sorts of other lore that goes with this uh, ceremony, um, which mark it, out as, mark it out as distinct and in some way both as barbaric and awesome. The presence of the emperor Aurelian in Rome and the presence of the emperor in order to celebrate an actual military victory was a novel event for its entire generation. The defeated usurpers Zenobia and Tetricus are paraded as well evidence of Aurelian's successes in the East and West. It was a humiliating spectacle to be paraded through Rome as a captured enemy leader. It implied, as it were, that probably you lacked the courage to have died in battle. Humiliated though they may be, Zenobia and Tetricus and the other captives are allowed to live by the generous Emperor Aurelian. He also shows his generosity to the people of Rome. Aurelian himself distributed largely the bread, the pork meat, but also, we are told, um, white tunics of uh, Egyptian and African uh, cloth. So uh, it, it was clearly a, a, you know, a very generous display of force there.
grateful in his triumph, Aurelian consecrates the temple he has built for the God of soldiers, Sol Invictus, whose power and favor he believes have made him invincible. Many scholars believe simply that this was trying to enforce conformity among the peoples of the empire for political purposes and also for religious purposes, and those two things are not that easily separated in the mind of a Roman. Aurelian decrees this day, December 25th, will be celebrated each year as the birthday of Sol Invictus. Later emperors, also seeking to unite Rome with religion, will adopt this date for the birth of Jesus Christ. Even now, over 1,700 years later, this once pagan holiday is celebrated as Christmas around the world. Throughout the empire in the third century, there's clearly a movement towards monotheism, towards different cults that believe in a single God and in, sometimes in a single redeeming God. The United Roman Empire now stretches from Palmyra to Britain, but in 275 AD, barbarians again wreak havoc in the east. Aurelian marches his army to Thrace to prepare for battle. Aurelian is a fascinating figure. He was a very energetic and dynamic individual. If you think of all the places in which he campaigned in his life, he must have had tremendous energy. It is this drive and energy that earn him the loyalty of his troops. Aurelian is, is very successful as a military leader. He, he knows his troops. He works very effectively with them. I'm sure he rewards them on a regular basis. He can, I think, depend on a, a significant uh, ongoing support from the soldiers. They, they trust him. You know, they see him as, as their leader. Having brought these soldiers the glory and honor of unimaginable victory, Aurelian never suspects the betrayal that festers among their ranks. The assassination of Aurelian is, is again one of these things that's very difficult to explain, particularly at a, at a time when he's been so successful militarily, when the troops should feel uh, satisfied with, with that success and with their rewards. Their treacherous act leaves the empire in shock. As far as we know, the news that the emperor was dead were received with dis disbelief. Um, and a lot of sadness. Um, he was uh, buried with great pomp in a magnificent tomb at the very spot where he was assassinated. Rome mourns the loss of a great emperor, one who has saved the empire from certain collapse. I think Aurelian's importance lies in the fact that it's the beginning of the Roman recovery, of the, as it were, the central Roman machine coming back to life, and he managed to reunite the empire, to bring it all under his central control. But in the end, not even the god of soldiers could protect him from the swords of traitors, and the empire he had worked so hard to unite fragments again. <laughs> 